Welcome to Therapy and Theology. I'm Lisa Turkhurst, and with me, I have Dr. Joel Mutamale and licensed professional counselor, Jim Cress. Now, we are doing a series right now in Therapy and Theology called Let's Stop Avoiding This Conversation, Six Topics Women Have Big Questions About. And in episode one of this series, we talked about why everyone loses when a woman is devalued. And in this very important episode, I want to talk about the part emotional abuse plays in silencing women. Mainly, we're going to really focus on the silencing of women. But first, I want to make sure we understand that there's two categories of silencing women. And we're going to cover those two different categories in this episode, we're going to cover one. And in the next episode, we're going to cover the other. So in this episode, we're going to focus on personal silencing. And in the next episode, public silencing. But let me first start by defining emotional abuse. And certainly, if you guys have anything you want to add to this definition, please feel free to do so. Because, you know, like I always say, Joel, you're going to bring the deep theology. Jim brings the therapeutic wisdom and education, and I bring the issues and sometimes Google definitions. Okay. <laughs> yes, why not? <laughs> Absolutely. So here's what I found from psychology today. Emotional abuse is a pattern of behavior. And if you're a note-taking person, I would love for you to really highlight that word pattern. Mm -hmm. It's not a mistake that someone makes that's just an offshoot, a rare happening, something that because they are in an emotionally sad place right now, it yeah, happened. It's not or a one off. It's right. not a one off. Mm -mm. So an emotional, um, so emotional abuse is a pattern of behavior in which the perpetrator insults, humiliates, and generally instills fear in an individual in order to control them. The individual's reality may become distorted as they internalize mm -hmm. the abuse as their own failings. And mm. I think the second word I'd want to highlight is internalizing mm -hmm. what the perpetrator or the abuser says, and then they, you know, take it inside of them and really think it's their own thought or their own failing. Anything you want to add to that? Well, we've talked about before, uh, indeed, the last uh, episode uh, about Aristotle saying we are what we repeatedly do, and, and I say repeatedly do and think. I like that internalization. And after I do that so many times, I think it's experientially for me with what I see in people and what's been my own journey at times is it's autonomic and automatic. I'm not even trying to do that rut where it's like it's just it mm -hmm. just goes right in. It becomes automatic, and the next thing you know, um, I'm believing really lies. And in a moment, I believe them in that moment. The other danger, I think, is people back away from calling emotional abuse abuse. Yeah, they do. It's a lot easier to name physical abuse because you see it, you can touch it. It's just so very evident. I think people are nervous about emotional abuse or even calling what is obviously emotional abuse abuse because of several reasons. I've heard, well, there's always two sides to every story. Mm. Just personal caveat here. I really cannot stand when people say there's always two sides to every story. I yeah. get what they're getting at, right. but this isn't a spectator sport. Mm. This is somebody's life being really, really very much hurt and diminished and devalued, like we talked about last week. So, you know, when when you say there's two sides to every story, why are we even talking about sides? Let's just get straight to the problem and let's help whoever's being hurt. That's more of the emotional abuse to say, well, there's two sides to every story. And when you look at, now as kids we heard, and you all have heard this, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. As you know, I told you that I fell recently, just tripped, and I bruised this finger Part of this, and you even noticed it the other day when we were in our planning session. So you can see some of the bruising there. Mm -hmm. The thing is, even studied in domestic violence, this is not about go hit someone. But when you're hit, the body keeps the score. The body knows the bruising says, oh, the tenderness right there says, I remember, yeah, I know what happened. But when it's emotional, and I'm going to add, as we all are going to add, the spiritual abuse, especially the emotional abuse that goes on, 
I don't always see the bruising. And inside I'm looking, did it really happen? Is it true? The other person may be gaslighting me. We've talked about that before. But the body at least, so sometimes, you know, keeps the score. Sometimes, I think most of the time, it's worse with emotional abuse, verbal and emotional abuse, than it is with the direct physical. Well, I think, Jim, another important part of that is yesterday when you walked in, you had a splint on your finger. Yeah. It was a visible indication for everybody that was in that room that you had gone through some type of traumatic event, some yeah, type of right. injury. Mm-hmm. We all knew to ask a question, to consider you, you know, do you, is your writing hand okay? Um, and even in the healing process, right? I think what we've learned is that there's different colors that are associated with different stages of, of healing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yet when we get to um, emotional abuse and we'll talk about spiritual abuse later, uh, there's a deceitfulness around it mm. because it's a, it's a hidden trauma. Trauma. It's an internalized trauma, um, and it can become very difficult for people on the outside to even know what is actually going on because there's not like some neon sign over your head that's saying, hey, I'm walking through emotional ab- abuse right now. Um, and so it makes us really consider, um, you know, how can we identify it and, and what's actually happening here? Mm. Another danger is sometimes emotional abuse has happened for so long. Mm. Maybe it was even in your family of origin and now it's being continued in your current relationship and it's been happening so long. What should be alarming has been normalized. That's called Stockholm syndrome, right? mm -hmm. With anybody in the trauma field knows it where you take Patty Hearst, that goes way back to the seventies where you are being held captive, whether you know it or not, emotionally or spiritually by a person, maybe physically. And you, after a while in Stockholm syndrome, begin to take on love or maybe the, the captors, they're actually being nice to me, or this is what I should do. I should allow them to treat me this way. And what I tolerate persists, but that Stockholm syndrome goes on in a lot of emotional abuse. And it's also the telltale sign of dysfunction. Very much. Because we tend to normalize our own dysfunctions and stop calling them dysfunction. And what I worry about sometimes is people are experiencing emotional abuse, but because there's this hesitation to call it what it is, um, then it starts to get normalized. And the more it's normalized, the more it is perpetuated. Here's what I want to say about that, though. I don't see tons of women rushing so quickly, wanting to call something emotional abuse. I think the assumption is like, oh, we can't give people permission. And it's not just women. Men get emotionally abused too. But, oh, we don't want to give people permission to call emotional abuse abuse because then they will abuse that phraseology, Mm. emotional abuse. Mm -hmm. But that's not what I'm seeing. What I'm sure that happens some. And so I don't want to discount that Mm -hmm. as a legitimate concern. But what I see so much more is that women and other people who are being emotionally abused, they're not rushing to call it emotional abuse. They're actually staying silent. Mm -hmm. And I think that should be the bigger concern is that when we don't call something what it is, when we don't call emotional abuse, abuse, then that in effect is the silencing of a woman. Which is its own internal, if I may say it that way, emotional abuse, where then I have taken what someone else is doing to me, I internalize it, and it'd be like me taking my finger, which was an accident, and just keep whacking it and just keep going on. That's the danger. I mean, I'm calling that naming, not blaming. Like I'm not going to blame a woman for doing that by any means or a man. But the idea is I internalize it and I do that self-inflicted emotional abuse. Remember, there's a great function with this. It seems odd, but blaming myself even blames an attempt to discharge pain and discomfort. Shame, self-hatred at my expense, we've said, that if I do internally emotionally abuse myself in a moment, it's an attempted antidote to pain. It actually works in the moment. Research shows that. Mm -hmm. But what happens in the longer term, really even in the shorter term, is I'm going to bruise my entire soul. Mm -hmm. But in the moment, it can feel like people, you know, we can go down the line of people cutting themselves. You hear a lot of that with younger people. In the moment, not good. All addictions, not good in the, you know, long term. But in the moment, it anesthetizes pain temporarily only to add more pain to yourself and to other people in your relationships. And so whether a victim is being blamed Mm -hmm. or a victim is being shamed, both of those would perpetuate this silencing that we're talking about. So this week we're going to talk about personal silencing and how it shows up. So let me just give a couple of examples. I think the silencing of a person and for the 
specific nature of this series, we're going to say the silencing of women. I do want to say again, I recognize not all victims of emotional abuse are women and not all women experience emotional abuse. So I just want to put that on the table, but here's how it shows up. If a woman is experiencing emotional abuse, how it contributes to her being silenced. Um, She feels like maybe it's not right or she's embarrassed to tell other people what's really going on behind closed doors. Um, I would also add, maybe she doesn't even know the right way to phrase it. And she has her own hesitations to call it abuse. Hmm. And so she dances around like, yeah, you know, this person hurting me, they may say some things, but they don't really mean it, you know, and all of a sudden they're making excuses for what is truly hurting Mm -hmm. them. Um, So they don't really want to tell people what's going on behind closed doors. And there's so many reasons for that. Um, Maybe she feels it would be disrespectful to the person hurting her if she shares. Hmm. And I see this a lot in Christian settings. Um, I'm a Christian. We're all Christians at this table. So I'm not at all calling out Christians. What I am saying is there's this big emphasis, or at least there was a huge emphasis when um, I was in my early 20s and entering into a marriage relationship. There was such a huge emphasis on the woman is to respect her husband. Um, And I do think women need to respect their husbands. I don't think it's helpful to elevate that to such an extreme that even sharing how she is being hurt is seen as disrespectful. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's another reason Mm -hmm. why sometimes it contributes to the silencing of a woman. We all know, we've talked about this, that the other person, if it was a marriage, we're talking about that just for a moment, that the wife may say, I want to just go to a counselor or an older woman like Titus too and share part of what's going on to tell the narrative how I'm experiencing things in my life and with my husband now, that indeed that husband often will, if he's not healthy at all, he will feel betrayed because it's the Wizard of Oz and the curtain is being pulled back. She's not just ripping it back to expose him, but she will feel as she's telling her story, often the threat of he's going to feel exposed. Ma'am, is is your energy, your your plan to just go expose him? No, I just need to share this. But the perpetrator over here or the unhealthy person, a guy in many cases, he is going to feel exposed, which we already know that. That's his stuff. And the perpetrator may not even know that what they're doing is emotional mm-hmm. abuse. Mm-hmm. So it's not doing him any favors or her, whoever the perpetrator is, any favors by not telling, because not telling just perpetuates the behavior. Mm -hmm. And it might be helpful for them to be educated. Like this is not acceptable. Maybe they saw it in their family of origin. Maybe they have done it for so long, they didn't even realize it was wrong. They don't understand Mm -hmm. how hurtful it is, or they just are unaware, not aware enough to know, hey, this is really hurtful Mm -hmm. to this other person. Um, Not only, I think, does the feeling of this could be disrespectful um, contribute to the silencing of a woman who's being emotionally abused? But I think there's a fear, too, that if she opens up, nothing will change. Mm. And I think a lot (laughs) of, of people who have been emotionally abused have experienced that because so many times I think they are told, well, just go home encourage him more, love him more. um, Pray for him. Pray for him. Wash, rinse, and repeat. That's not going to do any good, but I get it. And do we want to encourage our husbands or our significant other or our family member, whoever's causing the emotional abuse? Yes, we want to encourage them. Yes, we want to speak life over them. Yes, we want to pray for them. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, and yes. All of those things are good. But when it is contributing to the silencing of a woman, it's taken to an extreme that is no longer good or healthy. Mm. So I think part of this is the silencing of a woman. She doesn't know who to share it with, who's safe. And if she fears nothing will change, then what's the point of sharing it anyhow? It's futility, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Why bother? And the safety part real quick. If I feel that I share this with a person and that person is not safe, we call it a safe container, a safe place then let's just be real. It can, like a scorpion tail, come back and sting her because the person breaks that level of confidentiality 
and they tell it, they'll just tell one person, and next thing it no, it circles back. But a lot of I found in my world that I live in, there's a lot of confidentiality breaking. Uh, the scripture I think calls that gossip, by the way. But and you share your story, you better be careful. Slander. It's a hot mess if you share your story, any part of your story with someone who just has to tell one other person. Thus, mm-hmm. they're not safe. I think one of the challenges with this too is that it is a, a reversal of the ideal of Eden. Hmm. You know, and so we're talking about silencing and and where what do we find in Eden when God creates this garden? Well, in the ancient world, gardens were the places where kings resided. They were connected to the king's palace. What would you do when you went on to the garden? You would talk and hang out with your family members. And so the very first picture of Adam and Eve in Eden is a is a beautiful picture of them walking and talking with God. That was normative. So openness, transparency, active communication, uh, that is the the setting of human relationships. Relationships, And I think it's interesting that what the serpent does is actually uh, introduce, I'm going to argue, for emotional and spiritual abuse. And I think both things happen at the same time. And so I wrote on a couple things on spiritual abuse, and I will get it later, but I think it goes with emotional abuse as well. What is it? It's dishonest theological posturing. Wow. It mm. is goal-oriented towards establishing authority and wielding power. It's reframing what is real with an illusion of what they want to be real. It's lacking of charity and humility and consideration. And Jim, this is one I got from you. It's one-sided monologue, not two-sided dialogue. And so at the mm-hmm. end of it, the individual is silenced. Um, and uh, it is, uh, it's is—it's actually a, a defaming, actually, uh, mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. their image that they have of being in the image of God. You know, what's so fascinating to me, one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible is the very last verse of Genesis 2, before we get to Genesis 3, where the serpent comes on the scene. And that verse is, Adam and Eve were both naked, and they felt no shame. And I think there is this beautiful picture. They felt no shame because they had no other opinion to contend with, but the absolute love for one another and the absolute love of God. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just love. It was full acceptance as well. And that gets me to another reason why I think emotional abuse contributes to the silencing of a woman. And that is there's a deep fear. She won't be believed. Mm -hmm. And she believes I won't believe. Mm-hmm. I won't be believed. You're going to think I'm making this up or I'm crazy. Boy, have I, thank you. Yeah, or I'm uh, the problem. Yeah, I'm the problem. It's really mm-hmm. about me. I have seen that so many. You got to almost plow through that razor wire to get even to have a conversation with them because, no, you don't understand. It's like Tai Chiing all your moves away. Like, no, but I am the problem. What will people think? And maybe I'm. It's mm-hmm. amazing just to get through that for her to even be able to hear. And sadly, in talking with hundreds of women about this, I have heard that a common response that automatically makes her not feel believed is when they say, well, what did you do to cause him to say that? Mm -hmm. What did you do to cause him to, you know, treat you that way or whatever? And that's verbal and emotional abuse, live breaking news on the spot when someone says that, right? mm -hmm. A lot of people don't realize they're continuing, perpetuating, but also having their own exacerbation of... Verbal and emotional abuse. And if it's a person of authority, a ministry oh, leader, man. whatever it might be, now you add spiritual yeah. abuse on, yeah. on top of it. So it's a it's a cascading, avalanching type of issue that is all affirming to a woman, you know, that's being silenced that mm. it's gotta be me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I must be doing something wrong if the the people that are in authority figures in my life, people that I trust that, you know, if the initial reaction is <laughs> what did you do? not let me hear what's going on, Mm -hmm. then it's, it's devastating. It is devastating and leads to the last fear that I'll put on the table. I'm sure there's a lot of others, but if I share that I'm being emotionally abused, if I, if I can even get those words out, you know, I fear that I will be abandoned. I fear I will be rejected. Mm -hmm. I fear that, you know, people will think less of me. All those are possible. I'm exposing what I should not be exposing about something that should just be a, quote, private matter. So what it feels like is silence is safer. Mm -hmm. It does. Experientially, in the moment it is, I believe it is well put by you, Joel, for a moment it is safer. But we stay as sick as our secrets, as our silence. We really do. 
And so we want to cover this. This is a very long overdue conversation, and um, I think it's important. So if you have been experiencing this, I want you to lean in. If you feel like I've never experienced this, I still want you to lean in because I guarantee you yeah. someone you know, someone you love, someone you're in a relationship with, someone who is your friend is experiencing this because it is a pervasive problem. Mm -hmm. And we want to have you just become more aware of it and give you vocabulary around what's really happening and then also what we can do about it. As we discuss this very sensitive topic, we do want to operate with discretion, right? We want to yeah. be careful. We want to operate with discretion, but we don't want to perpetuate deceit. Mm. Well and put. there is deceit around the silencing of a woman. And Joel, you've already mentioned that as well. I also want to say that there's a big difference between privacy and secrecy. I do think that sometimes you don't want to invite the weight of public opinion into your very private pain. Mm. Um, I do think also if actions have been elevated to the form where you are not just in a difficult relationship, but as my friend Leslie Burnick says, a destructive relationship. Where there's smoke, there is a fire, and it's time to sound the alarm. We don't want a red flag to have to burn all the way to the ground before we tilt our head yeah. and go, huh, it's kind of red, right? <laughs> and so if there's even a hint of emotional abuse, I think it's time to get a licensed professional counselor involved. And if you don't have a licensed professional counselor, then someone else in your life who is trained specifically on how to recognize mm -hmm. emotional abuse. And certainly listening to this podcast is important. Mm -hmm. um, so as we go into this, operating in privacy, um, but not perpetuating secrecy, here's what I mean by that. We don't want to invite public opinion. So maybe don't go share this on social media, right? <laughs> of what you're experiencing and ask the whole world, you know, is this, is this emotional abuse? Mm -hmm. um, so we don't want to invite the weight of public opinion into the private pain. Um, but we do have to recognize that privacy is for the sake of healing. Mm -hmm. So if we are in a situation and the other person is repentant and they want their, and they're humble and they want this pattern of behavior to, um, to be addressed, then hold it private and the two of you work on it and get a trained person mm -hmm. involved. And then that's fine to hold it private. That's not being silenced. Mm -hmm. But what I see more often is that women feel like they're being forced to keep secrets and secrets are for the purpose of hiding, not for healing. And secrets actually perpetuate the problem because what is kept in the dark stays in the dark. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've also heard the expression like, who would want to be in relationship? This would be a perpetrator speaking to a victim. Who would want to be in a relationship with someone who shares their deepest, darkest secrets, right? And so that's the perpetrator saying, of course, you want to, you know, in order to be uh, in good standing in this relationship, um, we need to, we need to hold private. I think that's what they're trying mm -hmm. to say. But basically, you need to keep my deep, my secret. dark secrets. And my response to that is, why do you want to be in relationship with someone who has deep, dark secrets, right? Absolutely. But I've also seen that statement thrown out and other people around go, yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't want to be in a relationship with someone who shares my secrets and I don't want to be a relationship who, you know, with someone that I feel would just go out and expose me, right? Mm -hmm. And they're more concerned about the person, the victim telling the truth and getting help than they are about the person who has the deep, dark secrets. Mm -hmm. And so I think all of this contributes to the silencing of a woman, especially in terms of emotional abuse. So what do we do about it, Jim? And I loved when we were processing this, you said, first of all, we don't want to take our response to an extreme. So mm -hmm. we don't want to take like, okay, we've gotten to the place where we don't want to be silenced about the emotional abuse we're experiencing. But you made a great point. We don't want to immediately go from being absolutely quiet about it to suddenly swinging the pendulum in the other yeah. direction and taking our 
our voicing of it to such an extreme? Well, we can be. Lord knows I can be a creature of extremes. So I will have no voice or I will have co-signed, literally co-signed someone's unhealthy treatment of me. I read a book, a podcast, podcasts like this one, and I get some insight, which is good insight. And I take this beach ball that proverbially I've held underwater and you know I have this in my office. I have a beach ball and I have a hand grenade. It's been gutted, but it's a real hand grenade, right? And I hold it underwater. And finally, I begin to go, yeah, I need to say something here. And I come out like a grenade and I do things and I have this massive vulnerability hangover later, which means I just went out and said all the stuff and I'm like, I should have not, I was not emotionally self-regulated mm-hmm. during that time. I understand that. So the idea of being able to slowly be able to find a safe person and begin at 30,000 feet and say, I'd like to tell you, here's what I'm experiencing it versus coming out moving from, you know, being, you know, quiet like a mouse and then getting a megaphone. I understand why that's that danger. It goes quick when I finally found my voice and I got to proclaim it from the rooftops. You'll regret that, especially if you're doing that in such a way that you have a bit of vengeance. I've seen that. I mean, just I, I want to get somebody. Mm-hmm. You're going to regret that later if you have integrity, I think. Mm. And so... Besides just the knowledge of, okay, we want to find our voice, Mm -hmm. but we don't want to go from mouse to megaphone. Right. So what is, what does that middle ground look like? So I, what I literally experientially do with people, if I have a chance to, to work with them, uh, is to have them come and say, I would like to listen. So I know I'm a safe person as a licensed professional counselor and licensed clinical mental health counselor, I am bound by confidentiality and they know it. So say, let me hear your story. I, to use my words in the vernacular, I don't egg them on. Yeah, come on. Wow. Woo. I need to stay. I mean, act adult, but like a professional, right? At one level and say, but the three words I use is tell me more. Mm. So I'm trying to slowly invite them to put out their data on the table. And you know, because we've talked so much about fact and impact, I'll say, okay, let's stop for a moment. Here's the fact. This is what happened to you. Let's talk for a moment. What's the impact? So I'm already slowing them down, trying to. What do you think that did to you? Remember the same sun that hardens clay softens butter. What do you think that did to you? And then I'll say, let's just take a thought, just a thought gently and go, where might you be in your family of origin story? Naming, not blaming. Where are you? Mm. We said if it's hysterical, often it could be historical. Where did this ever happen to you before? I believe right there, and we talked about this in the last podcast. Jesus, the woman at the well, he's deep into the narrative. I mean, he could have said, "Listen, I'm gonna tell you right now. You're sleeping with dudes." You, he finally says, and I just feel him lean back and say. Tell me about your husband. Now, that's a wise counselor. That's a wise friend that doesn't just go for the juggler right away. Mm -hmm. So I try to draw them out, and I'm trying to invite them to emotional self-regulation that they literally, in this amygdala part of their brain where trauma is, can slow themselves down, regulate, and say, yeah, this is what happens, and I use then my hub. It's not a technique. It's true. H-U-B, I hear you, ma'am, and I understand you. Mm or I'm trying to understand you, and B is I believe you and I believe in you. Because most people are just not believed. They're going to think, oh, boy. But I'm working, and you as a good friend, watching, tuning in, listening today, can help your friends as iron sharpens iron. You can help them uh, regulate, and let's just remember the word of God in Proverbs 15, 1, a gentle answer turns away Wrath turns away anger, double hermeneutic. As I get gentle with you, it's going to lower my anger. I'm going to soften, and it will help you soften. But harsh words, come on, you ought to get him. I can't believe he did that. My harsh words stir up my anger and will stir up yours. That is one of the most powerful applicable verses for talking about emotional and spiritual abuse. I like what you said there, Jim, about fact and impact, because sometimes the facts get a little confusing. Well, does that qualify as emotional abuse? Does this qualify as emotional abuse? You know, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. And so I think with the fact, we have to look at the spectrum of severity and the spectrum of occurrence. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's important. But I think a bigger thing that I think gets left out of the conversation is the impact. I think it's easier to identify emotional abuse when you consider the impact that it has had on the person experiencing the fact. And we're back to the bruised hand that we can see Mm -hmm. the coloration and Joel's excellent point that he elaborated on. That is the impact where it gets harder to say, 
what is the impact to my soul? I think it just takes some time. Proverbs 20, verse 5, the purposes in all of our hearts are deep water, so we must go down deep to draw them out. It's harder to see that emotional and spiritual impact. Joel, I want to get to you, but um, before we do, Jim, there were three Gs that I found really helpful Mm -hmm. when you were talking about, okay, we don't want to be like a mouse, but we don't want to swing it over to a megaphone, Mm -hmm. and that was grovel, grandstand, and then grounded is in Mm -hmm. the middle. So do you want to just touch on those three Gs? Pretty simple. I just sat with someone one day a number of years ago, and I said, you know, you don't want to do this. Thank you, seriously, Holy Spirit, for being my teacher. <laughs> the Holy Spirit gave it to me. And I said, you're in a relationship. You don't want to grovel. That's just begging and walking on eggshells. If you walk on eggshells, the relationship in integrity is over for the moment. Mm-hmm. Real integrity in a relationship cannot happen. Real connection, if somebody's walking on eggshells, don't grovel. Please, is there any way? Would you just hear me? Even the voice box tightens. The other extreme is, well, fine, I won't grovel. I'm going to grandstand. And I had a person once, no kidding, say to me, I finally got your point. I stopped walking on eggshells and I started, said it word for word, I am stomping on eggshells all over my spouse. He kind of missed the point. Don't grovel, please beg, don't grandstand. I'll just get big, and here's my line in the sand. I dare you to cross it. I see people do that. And start throwing emotional abuse back. Uh, Right there, quid pro quo, Clarice. Mm -hmm. It's like bam, bam, bam. And then to be grounded. And that is to be that healthy adult self. You want to love well, 1 Corinthians 13, when I was a child, I doggone it, I acted like a child, thought, reasoned, I love that, reasoned, I rationalized like a child. But when I became an adult, no therapist, no Bible teacher, no theologian, for a moment, I put away childish things. I put away, so that piece is to be grounded is to say, is somebody going to come at me and then I just react or do I want to learn, take a breath, lean back and respond not react. It will change over time. You say, man, I feel like I'm, I feel more like an adult. I'm responding. They came in and pressed buttons. So you don't have to show up to every drama you're invited to. Mm-hmm. You just yeah. don't. You got popcorn on a Coke and say, I might show up to this one. No, no. Mm, I think that's so good. And I think part of staying grounded is to realize you're empowered to call out hurt without expressing and creating more hurt. Mm, well stated. And so we don't want to grovel, beg that person to change when they be may be unwilling or incapable of changing, right? Mm-hmm. And we don't want to grandstand, throw abuse back at that person. Mm-hmm. We want to be grounded in the middle, find our voice appropriately and get help because ultimately we want the emotional abuse to end. Mm-hmm. Oh, did cannot- you see that by the way? Under the Third G, be grounded. Do you just see what's right below it? That fourth G snuck in on us, and you yes, know what I it did. is. Grief. We talked about that. We've talked about it in our webinars. We've been, you and I have been doing with Joel, is the grief to have ba- all good, healthy boundaries and self-care require grief. What do you mean is, but if I have this boundary, this person may talk about me, they may blast me on social media, stop liking my post, or they may divorce me or leave me. And so the idea of staying in that grounded place usually... I think will require grief. You may not see it coming yet, but the idea of it will cost you something to stay grounded. Mm-hmm. Always does. Yeah, and to connect these things theologically, I remember when you were talking about this for the first time, Jim, some lights were gone off in my mind of thinking of these responses with our identity mm-hmm. as image bearers of God. Mm-hmm. So here's what happens. When you grovel, what you're doing is you're participating in being subhuman. We're actually so denying good. the image of God. And so a woman who who goes into a position of silence or grovel, whatever it might be, it is actually denying your image that you rightly bear in, uh, in God. Grandstanding is now the opposite. It is being superior or akin to being like God. So if groveling is being subpar, sub-image, then grandstanding is actually elevating yourself above the image that was given to you, that was Mm -hmm. granted to you. It's a position of superiority. So being grounded is actually rightly living out the reality of being in the likeness and image of God. And so then I'm going to connect the fourth one. Well, how do you do this? Grief. That's what you just described. Grief is the counterbalance. It's the protection for us um, to keep us from falling too deep into groveling or elevating too high into grandstanding. And grief taps into humility, and humility is what grounds us. And mm. I think that's so important. And I just want to, just from another standpoint, when we hear silence, 
I want us to be careful that we don't equate silence with um, like a one dimensional not talking. Right. Because as in wisdom, (laughs) no, I don't know if that's what you mean. Like there's a place to not talk. Yeah. So there's a place of meditation. So, yeah. And we'll get to that. But I'm also thinking about the Garden of Eden when the temptation, the first temptation takes place with the serpent. The serpent is so deceitful because the serpent doesn't just squash uh, the conversation. Right. The serpent actually reframes, realters. It, it brings in theological dishonesty. And, and what, what happens is a silencing through suppression. So the woman is able to speak. With, uh, the irony is that Adam's on his silent the whole time. Right. That's the greatest irony of this entire thing. But there's a suppression And so if you're in a position of suppression where um, you're being silenced or um, you're being almost manipulated, and this is the the other danger, you're being manipulated and almost um, led with the, the breadcrumbs down a certain way to think, to act, to feel a certain way, that is a type of suppression of your identity, of who you are as a Mm -hmm. human being that takes away that rightful expression of being able to be honest and transparent with what you're feeling and what you're doing. And so here's the, the other question. Well, why do I deserve a voice? Like theologically, I don't know if there's anybody thinking like, you know, why you do I even deserve? On, you can count on that because I've heard that myriad of times. Uh, do I even get to speak? Should I? Do I have the right? And yeah. I, and my answer is really simple because you're a daughter of the king. Come on. Because you're a son of the king. Because you're made in the likeness and the image of the king. Now, here's the interesting thing about being royalty. Being royalty gives you incredible privilege, incredible honor. And there's also simultaneous massive responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so we have the opportunity and we're being welcomed into a conversation. And the action of denying that and stripping that away from you is an an offense. This is just me talking at this point. It is offense against the royal image that you bear. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to do truth. Um, I'm going to say statements and I want you to say this is true or this is false. Okay. Is this a contest between Joel and <laughs> me contest. just to see, no. to see who wins, keep score? And I'm only going to ask gonna a couple win. of these, but I think it's important. Um, Joel, we'll make you go first. Theologically yes. speaking, mm-hmm. um, if someone is experiencing emotional abuse and they're feeling silenced in that emotional abuse, will it get better on its own? Absolutely not. Jim? From a therapeutic standpoint, if I am just quiet about this emotional abuse and I'm just silent, like I allow myself to be silenced, then will it get better on its own? No, it's carbon monoxide. It's colorless, odorless, tasteless gas, and you will die. Mm-hmm. Okay, let me throw out another one. Um, if I stay quiet about this issue then eventually the other person is going to have this great revelation that what they're doing is wrong and um, immediately know how to repair this hurt that they have caused me. Uh, uh, The theologian in me is going to have to nuance this a little bit. Is it possible? Well, sure, the Holy Spirit can do anything at any time. Is it probable? No. No. Okay. Good Um, answer. Yeah. And I think human wisdom and godly wisdom requires us to not live in the fairy tale land of the possibility when we have the the plausibility, the the actual ability to step into what is necessary in order to make action. So Jim, I'm going to ask you the same question. I'm going to change it just a little bit. Um, If the, if doing things that are qualified or, or that considered emotional abuse, if there is this pattern of behavior, will the perpetrator or the abuser, even if they recognize finally that what they're doing is wrong, will they on their own know how to repair this? You know, you nuanced that question. And I love that because Jesus looked upon them with compassion. I want to look at him with a long bony finger. I like how you asked that. And that is, it's Psalm 51. I take all, all my people to that if they'll go. And that's a broken and contrite heart and spirit. But I like to invite them. I'm Ezekiel, the watchman on the wall. I warn, and then my hands are off. 
If they're there and I'm saying, do you want to change? Watch, are you willing to change? Are you willing to call it this? I don't know. Wait, take a step back. Are you willing to be willing to call it emotional abuse and verbal abuse? Maybe. If not, are you willing to be willing? And then I get them. Usually someone will go, yeah, I can see that. That Have you ever been emotionally abused yourself? Let's just use the play with the term. They say, yeah, I have. Then I believe they can move forward. But there's also, again, the cost of what they're going. It's a whole operating system for many. They have to change. And it's a buy one, get one free. Listen, when you verbally emotionally abuse another person, it's going to come right back on you. Your other-centered contempt for other people. Like the word of God tells us in John, you're a murderer in your heart. You hate someone. You're a murderer in your heart. It will always come out of your own self-hatred and self-contempt. That's been proven. Books are written on it. So Mm. that's proven. So if they want to change and are willing to, here's what it's going to take. And a lot of times change in life, in the Christian life, and this is a direct old Christian quote, the Christian life in real change has often not been tried and found difficult. The truth is the Christian life in real change has been found difficult and left untried. The rich young ruler. I mean, I'm all learning. I want to change, Jimbo. I'll do anything. Here's what it will cost you. You can't do it on your own operating system. And he went away sad. I give him a break. The rich young ruler said, I'm all in. I want help. People come to us for help, theological help, counseling help, what have you. I want to change. Here's what will cost you to do that. Back to grief. And often I have people just, it cost me too much. I didn't have to go through all that. I don't want to look at my family story. I'm out of that. So someone who is being emotionally abused, it's not going to get better on its own. And even Mm -hmm. if the perpetrator says, okay, I realize this is wrong, chances are they are going to need to be theologically discipled to know how to um, take healthier steps or and probably both discipled in the spiritual sense and equipped in the emotionally healthy sense to know even what an emotionally healthy relationship looks like and certainly the steps that they're going to need to take to repair the situation that they're currently and in. And discipleship that is a process. I know, Jim, you're going to have a lot to say about this, but as long yeah. as it took you to get into this mess, it is an unhealthy reality or perspective to think that with a snap of the finger, you're going to get yourself out and you're going to live in healthy patterns. And you're going to create healthy rhythms. It takes work and it takes effort and it takes the family of God that, that comes alongside of you to encourage, that to encourage you. Mm-hmm. It takes a deep sense of humility to recognize that there is um, there is some clinical license like therapeutic work that that it, um, is absolutely necessary, and so we've got to be like careful not to reduce this thing down to it being you know this quick fix. Um, it is it takes work and it takes time, and there's consequences that are all around it, mm-hmm. and we've got to be able to deal with those. In yeah. the new book that I have, um, it's called Good Boundaries and Goodbyes, um, and It releases in November of 2022, depending on whenever you're listening to it. It may or may not already be out. Um, But I talk a lot about realizing you're you need to have this notion that you're not powerless or stuck in this, because if an emotionally abused woman or an emotionally abused person hears that it's not going to get better on its own and that this other person is going to need to own it and take the necessary steps, their mind may automatically go, Mm. what if they are incapable or unwilling to take those steps? Now what? Mm -hmm. Because now I'm back. If they're unwilling or incapable, now I feel powerless again. So that's where we have to realize where there is the presence of this kind of chaos. It usually means there is a lack of boundaries and you can be empowered to have healthy boundaries. That does not mean that you put a boundary on this other person to try to force them to change, but rather you recognize I need to boundary myself to protect myself from the emotional abuse that I may be experiencing. And in doing that, you may not be able to get this other person to stop doing what they're doing. Yeah. Therefore, you need to reduce the access that they have so that the impact of their continued pattern of behavior will not devastate you. So I would encourage you, boundaries are an important part of this discussion. We're not going to unpack those today because we just don't have time, but that is mm-hmm. an additional resource I think you would find very helpful. I want to end today, what are the next steps Like if you do feel like because of emotional abuse, you have been silenced. I'm going to give a couple and then you guys can take it 
wherever you want to go with it and realize we're running short on time. Okay. (laughs) Um, So first decide what's really happening to you. Is this a typical difficulty in a relationship? Because all relationships experience difficulties. Um, Is this something that they're willing and capable of talking about? Are they receptive to being open to thoughts that you want to share? Um, There's a big difference between a difficult situation in a relationship and a destructive situation in a relationship. Destructive means you are losing the best of who you are. Mm -hmm. You're being diminished. You are being um, harmed in in the emotional response even that your body is having to this. So you've got to be honest. The other thing I would recommend as a next step is name the problem. It's important to name the problem. If we don't name the problem, then we may not be able to work on the problem. That's right. And or we may work on the wrong problem. Mm-hmm. We may take such ownership of this happening that we think we are the problem. And um You know, we may suddenly think, well, I just need to be more humble or I need to be more long suffering or I need to just forgive 70 times seven. We do need to forgive 70 times seven. But Jesus, knowing the nature and the nurture of Jesus, watching and reading about him and how he operated in the context of human relationships, Jesus never perpetuated abuse. And he Mm -hmm. always had sympathy for the oppressed or the ones being harmed. So when Jesus says forgive 70 times seven, I believe that Jesus is saying, create enough distance between you and that other person that if their continued pattern of behavior that is hurting you never stops, that you can forgive from a distance and not be destroyed in the process. Um, So anything that you guys would like to add as next steps for someone listening and thinking, I identify with this and I need to know what to do about it. If you're in the middle of it, I would just ask you and what I've already said, remind yourself that you are worthy of the voice that God gave you. Mm. Thank you, Joel. In the show notes will be the reference of a dear mutual friend, Leslie Vernick. And I would encourage you to go on social media. She has a wonderful uh, presence of a lot of free material. She is my go-to person when it comes to emotionally abusive and destructive relationships on any level. She's godly. She's biblical. And if you will go there, we talked about safety earlier. This is an incredibly safe, wise woman who will help guide you through it. Leslie Vernick, and that information will be in the show notes. Yes. And I have um, turned to Leslie Um, for so many resources and so grateful for the ministry and the coaching that she has to take what we've started today and make it even more personally applicable for what you're walking through. Mm -hmm. Um, Jim, thank you so much, not only for what you've contributed to this conversation, but it's no secret, you are my personal therapist, counselor, um, all things healing guru. And I am so grateful for you. And Joel, the number of hours that we have processed (laughs) this very topic, sitting around tables from a theological standpoint, I'm so grateful for what you've added today and so grateful for what you've given me in my own personal healing journey. So we're grateful for you. Thank you. Totally. Thank you. And on that note, we'll say... Goodbye until next time.